This is a very important package that must be delivered timely and safely. But I have been studying WAN distribution at night, replied Pat. How will I ever fully learn unless you give me a shot? Pat thought for a moment and then offered a solution. I heard that this package is larger than most and may require a two-packet job. Pat continued, what if I took the job of Pam and Packet? Mulling over Pat's proposition, Benedict responded, well, Pam is our best courier and has made the trip to the Puma Kingdom many a time. Okay, under Pam's direction, you may deliver the package. Elated, Pat hugged his boss and thanked him profusely. Pat then rushed off to the WAN warehouse to meet with Pam. <coughs> Pat arrived at the WAN warehouse and marveled at the number of packages that awaited delivery. He saw Pam at the back of the warehouse sifting through packages, so he ran over to greet her. Hi, Pam, said Pat. Hi, Pat, good to see you. Benedict called earlier to say that we are delivering an important package to the Puma Kingdom together. Pat piped, yes, it's for Ruby Rails, too. Pam echoed Pat's enthusiasm. Great, I was just sorting through the packages to get what we need. Pat noticed the packages were different from what he had delivered in the past. Some of these packages had similar looking messages with uppercase words like get and post. Other messages were completely garbled. So what kind of packages are these, asked Pat. I can understand most of them because they follow a pattern, but others look like nonsense. Pam answered, in the world of WAN distribution, and even WAN, packages typically conform to a specific protocol for their messages. I'm sure you're already familiar with this concept in your type of deliveries. In this case, these messages adhere to the HTTP protocol, a standardized format for requesting information and replying with information. Even the garbled informations follow that format, but they've been encrypted to ensure confidentiality between the requester and recipient. Encrypted messages use the secure HTTPS protocol. I see, he acknowledged that. So how do patterns in the HTTP format work? Good question, replied Pam. As I mentioned, HTTP messages are usually grouped into requests and replies, which have similarities and differences in their formats. As you might guess, Requests are outgoing packages, so they require specific fields to properly describe the request. Their format looks like this. On the first line is the method of the request, the resource being requested, and the version of HTTP being used. The next several lines are for headers, which list extra information for limitations on the request. After skipping a line, the request may supply an optional message body to further qualify the resource being requested. That's a lot of information. What types of methods are there, inquired Pat? There are several standard methods, answered Pam, but the most common ones we see from our clients are get, post, put, and delete. Methods indicate to the receiver the nature of the request, so they know how to process the request and generate an appropriate reply package. Get requests are the most basic and indicate a simple request for the resource. Post requests indicate that the request requester wants to provide some information to the receiver, but the requester isn't too sure where to supply the information. For example, if a requester wanted to purchase an item from the store, they could send their order details to a generic resource name like slash checkout. Then the store will reply with an acknowledgement of the order along with the receipt. Put requests are very similar to post requests, but the requester typically knows where to supply the information. Generally, our clients use put requests for updating information that the receiver manages for them. For example, if a store keeps track of a requester's name, then the requester can use a put request to update their name at the store. Finally, delete requests are used to delete a resource. If a requester has multiple addresses saved in their account at a store, and they can use a delete request to remove one of those addresses. I see. So methods make requesters' intent more precise, but I'm still confused by the headers. What did you mean by extra information or limitations earlier? Headers are primarily used to inform metadata, which basically means information that describes the package itself. Remember the request may be a get method for a resource like slash friends. The requester might specify that they would like to receive back their list of friends in a particular format. Therefore, the requester can add an accept header to ask for a reply in an exact format. 
it's still up to the recipient to honor the format request in their reply. Now, there are many more headers than methods, and a receiver can support their own custom headers, too. Headers are key value pairs, which just means each header line consists of the name of the header, a colon, and the value for the header. The accept header I mentioned earlier that looked like accept star slash star, which means the requester will accept any format from the recipient. Other examples include accept text slash HTML, like the package will deliver. In addition to the accept header, there are other common headers that clients and their recipients use. The content type header allows a recipient to include in their reply which format they are actually sending back. The host header allows a requester to specify the particular address of the recipient. It is especially necessary if multiple recipients live in the same kingdom. The content link header allows a recipient to describe how big the reply message is. And there are various other headers available to requesters and recipients. Wow, that's a lot of options. If recipients use headers too, does that mean their reply packages are similar to request packages? Yes, the reply messages are almost the same, but instead of a request message method, they start with a status line. The status line includes the version of HTTP, a status code, and status description. Just as methods offer a standard way to describe the type of request, status codes allow a standard way to describe the type of reply. Status codes are simply three-digit numbers followed by a descriptive phrase. The most common status code is 200, which is usually followed by OK. This means everything is good with the request package, so the recipient can reply with the requested information. A status code of 304 not modified means the request package is for a resource that the requester already received before and that the resource hasn't changed since it was last sent. This allows the recipient to avoid resending the message copy and respond more quickly to the requester. A status code of 404 not found indicates that the recipient does not have the requested resource, so they cannot fulfill the request. In fact, any status code that starts with 4 means that the client's request is invalid for some reason so the recipient will not reply with the message. Another example is 401 unauthorized, which means the requester is not allowed to request a particular resource. Finally, status codes that start with 5 mean that the recipient is having trouble responding with the package, even if the request is invalid. The most general example is 500 internal server error. If the recipient's warehouse or processing is having issues fulfilling requests, you really know your HTTP, Pam. Thanks for explaining that to me. I think I'm ready to deliver this package. Pat studied the package to find the address for the Puma Kingdom. He noticed that the host address said rubyonrails.org. Um, started Pat, where do we deliver this? I don't understand this host address. I thought addresses were just numbers. Pam replied, ah, this sounds like a perfect time for you to learn about DNS. Let's go. With a puzzled look on his face, Pat proceeded up the warehouse with Pam to deliver the package. As Pat and Pam exited the warehouse, Pat asked, what is DNS? Pam answered, DNS stands for the Domain Name System. To answer your earlier question, yes, addresses are just numbers. However, in the world of WAN, there are over four billion addresses. There is even a newer number format that has more addresses than that. Therefore, it's difficult for our clients to remember the addresses of their recipients. DNS allows recipients to advertise their address with more memorable domain names like the host address rubyonrails.org. It's up to us to then use DNS to determine the actual address for the domain name. Sometimes we keep a copy of the address for a short time, but I couldn't find one for rubyonrails.org we'll need to make a stop at the Resolver Kingdom in the ISP continent to get the address. So let's take the UDP Express train. It's usually the fastest way to get there. After several milliseconds, they arrived at the Resolver Kingdom. They found the resolution office and stepped through the door. Pam greeted the office clerk. Hello, Ren. My friend Pat and I need the address for a domain name. Ren responded, hey, Pam, great. What is the domain name you need to resolve? It's rubyonrails.org. Ren walked over to his file cabinet to begin his search. After quickly thumbing through his records, he raised his head with a disappointing look. 
Sorry, we don't have an address for that domain name right offhand. We'll need to retrieve it from one of the authoritative DNS kingdoms. Authoritative? Interjected Pat. Inferring Pat's lack of knowledge on DNS, Ren replied, yes. Because there are so many addresses, it's not feasible for all the resolver kingdoms to keep records for every address. Therefore, the actual domain name records are distributed among all the authoritative kingdoms. Authoritative means they are the final say on the address for a domain name. We only keep copies of addresses as time and storage in our file cabinets allow. Say, we're a little short-staffed today. Would you mind finding the address at its authoritative kingdom? Normally, we retrieve the king address from the appropriate kingdom while you wait here. However, this would be a great opportunity for you to understand DNS better. I know your friend Pam here has done it before, so you'll be in good hands. Sure, that sounds great. Thanks, this will help us immensely. Rin handed Pat a slip of paper and continued, here is the address for the root domain kingdom A. That should be a good place to start. Pat and Pam left the resolver office and hopped back on the UDP express. Pat handed the address to the conductor, and off they went again. Several milliseconds later, they arrived at Root Domain Kingdom A. As he stepped off the train, Pat noticed a large building in the distance and marveled at the number of couriers entering and exiting. They entered the building and joined one of the lines at the front desk. After a short time, a clerk motioned them forward. Welcome to the Root Domain Kingdom. How may I direct you? Pat responded, hello, we need the address for rubyonrails.org. Without even hesitating, the clerk replied, ah, .org, here are a few NS kingdoms to try. The clerk printed off a list and handed it to Pat. Pat, visibly confused, inquired, but these are just a bunch of addresses that go with other domain names. Where is an address for rubyonrails.org? Right, we don't keep A records on individual domain names like that. All we have are NS records on the NS kingdoms for the top level domains. You'll have to ask one of those kingdoms for more help. A records? NS records? Top level domains? A still befuddled Pat asked. Pam stopped Pat, speaking to the clerk. Thank you so much for your help. We'll be on our way. Pam pulled Pat aside and said, don't worry, this is how DNS works. We need to deliver this package soon, so let's get over to one of these NS kingdoms. OK, I trust you, but I'm still confused. Sorry if I made a scene back there. Let's deliver this package. Great, I'll explain more about DNS after we visit the NS kingdom. After another trip on the UDP Express, they arrived at one of the .org NS kingdoms. Just like the last time, they entered a large office and approached the front desk. The clerk greeted them, hello, and thank you for coming to the A0.org kingdom. What can I do for you today? Pat replied with his request, we need the address for rubyonrails.org, please. Do you have it? The clerk searched his records, hmm, rubyonrails.org, aha. Pat's eyes grew wide in anticipation. The clerk printed off a slip of paper and handed it to Pat. This will get you to your destination. With a smile, Pat gave his thanks. As he and Pam walked away, he began to read the paper. His smile slowly faded away. These are more NS records all to the same place, he exclaimed. They start with an S, followed by a number, and then dot gratis DNS dot DK. It seems like these DNS kingdoms keep giving us the runaround. Not at all, responded Pam. Like I said, this is how DNS works. I promised I would explain everything, so let's board the train, and I'll clarify how DNS works. Back on the train, Pam addressed Pat. Okay, I don't want you to be confused, so let's walk through DNS. DNS is a recursive and iterative system we use to determine addresses for domain names. If we don't already have a copy of the address, then normally we go to our local resolver like earlier. Next, we give the local resolver a recursive request for an address. What that means is that they will try whatever they need to do to obtain the address. If they don't have a copy of the address already, then they will take an iterative process to find it from another kingdom. You and I have undertaken the iterative process this time, so you can understand how resolvers work to retrieve the addresses we couriers need. This iterative process is crucial to ensure DNS kingdoms can reasonably store the billions of addresses and domain names. Therefore, it has a hierarchical structure that starts with the root domain kingdoms. The root domain kingdoms are responsible for storing addresses for the top-level domain kingdoms. 
Top-level domains, or TLDs for short, are just categorical names used in domain names. You've already seen .org, which is primarily used by organizations. Other popular TLDs are .com, .net, and .io, which startups love. There are numerous other TLDs as well. The root domain kingdoms hand out NS records to these TLD kingdoms, which are like referrals. The root domain kingdoms are essentially saying, I don't know where rubyonrails.org is, but I can direct you to someone that has a better shot at knowing. Next, the TLD kingdoms do something similar. Usually, a TLD kingdom only knows about NS kingdoms. Regular kingdoms, like the Puma kingdom where we're headed, will employ at least two of these NS kingdoms to advertise the rubyonrails.org address. In turn, these NS kingdoms will register with the TLD kingdoms. Then, when a request comes to the TLD kingdoms, they can hand back referral NS records to the NS kingdoms that know about the final address. Finally, remember earlier when our resolver friend, Ren, mentioned authoritative DNS kingdoms? These NS kingdoms, which we'll visit next, are typically the authoritative kingdoms that have the final say on addresses for regular kingdoms. Therefore, they hand out A or C name records. A records are known as host records. They finally give the actual address for a domain name. C name records are like aliases. If rubyonrails.org wanted to advertise another domain name like rubyonrailsforthewind.com, then they could use a C name record that aliases back to rubyonrails.org. The benefit of this over an A record is that if their address changes, they only need to update one A record for rubyonrails.org. The alias will still work because it still points to whatever address rubyonrails.org points to. Therefore, you see that the DNS kingdoms are structured in a distributed, hierarchical manner. They are recursive in that the higher levels of the system will yield to the lower levels to eventually get an address for a domain name. This allows addresses to be stored in a saner, more efficient manner, albeit at the cost of more time to retrieve an address. This delay in time to obtain an address, also known as latency, is also why higher levels like the resolver will save a copy of the address for a while after they retrieve it. If the res resolver receives another request for the address, then they can use their copy and avoid the extra latency to retrieve it from an authoritative kingdom. Wow. It all makes sense now. If all the kingdoms stored all the addresses, then that would require a lot of storage. It would also complicate keeping addresses up to date at all the kingdoms. Exactly. Thank you for explaining that, Pam. I feel better now. Latency sounds pretty important, so we need to get a move on. No doubt. Unfortunately, we are always limited by distance. We'll do our best after we get the address from the last kingdom. Pat and Pam finally arrived at one of the NS kingdoms. Like before, they entered a large building and met with one of the clerks. At long last, they obtained the address for rubyonrails.org. Pat was more than elated. Pat began, great, now we have the address. Let's hop back on the UDP Express to deliver the package. Pam responded, well, it's not that easy. Huh? HTTP packages can't be delivered via the UDP Express. We have to use the TCP turbo line instead. Before we can do that, we need to make sure the Puma Kingdom is ready for our delivery, too. We need to head back to KPS and schedule the delivery, so let's go. Pat and Pam returned to the KPS warehouse to prepare for the actual delivery. Pam explained the final steps. Pam started, as I mentioned, we have to deliver HTTP packages via the TCP turbo line because they require TCP assurance. TCP Assurance guarantees that the package will be delivered untampered in its entirety. Carriers and recipients accomplish this by acknowledging each other's messages. After we deliver a HTTP package, in addition to the reply message, the recipient will also send back an acknowledgement to let us know that they received the package. Sometimes they'll combine the response and acknowledgement to save on postage. If we don't receive an acknowledgement within a certain amount of time, then we assume that they didn't receive the package, so we'll try delivering again. 
will always make sure that the package ultimately arrives at its destination. However, because HTTP packages are so popular, and because there are many other parcel carriers and couriers, the TCP turbo line can suffer overload or congestion. Therefore, after the great turbo line collapse in 1986, the Congestion Control Administration, or CCA, formed to regulate turbo line usage. CCA has strict guidelines to ensure that the turbo line doesn't become so overwhelmed that no package can be delivered. When a carrier needs to deliver a new package, they have to schedule the delivery with the recipient. We call this a connection. To avoid congestion of the turbo line, CCA dictates a sliding window of the number of packages that may flow between the carrier and the recipient for a given connection. This sliding window just means that the carrier may only deliver a small number of packages at one time. As long as the packages are acknowledged, then the window can slide over, so to speak, and permit the carrier to deliver one more package than before. If the carrier does not receive acknowledgments in a timely manner, then they must back off and typically have the number of packages they may send at once. Basically, lack of acknowledgments indicates that the turbo line is reaching congestion levels, so the carrier must reduce its window to help relieve the congestion. I see. That sounds like extra work and extra latency, but it makes sense to ensure that the package is delivered and there is fair use of the turbo line among all carriers. Right. Now let's get our connection set up so we can deliver the package. We'll need the help of our coordinator, Sam Sink, for that. Pat and Pam walked over to Sam Sink's office in the warehouse. Pam greeted Sam while handing him the address for the Puma Kingdom. Hello, Sam. We have a package to deliver to the Puma Kingdom as soon as possible. Can you set up a connection for us, please? Sam replied, hey, Pam, sure thing. Let me give them a ring. Sam called the Puma Kingdom, and milliseconds later, a voice responded back. Hello? Hello, this is Sam Sink of KPS. I would like to schedule a delivery. We are ready to synchronize a connection with you. One moment, please. OK, we acknowledge your delivery requests and are ready to synchronize as well. However, our receiving department is a little backed up at the moment. To prevent any issues with this delivery, we need you to keep your window size to one package, please. Roger that. We acknowledge your reply and window size request. We will have the delivery over there shortly. Sam hung up the phone and relayed the information from the call to Pat and Pam. Pam was unsurprised. I figured they might limit the flow of packages. The Puma Kingdom is very popular. Well, this does change things slightly. What do you mean, questioned Pat. Remember that this package was a two-packet job? Fire Chrome Industries requested two resources. In addition to requesting the root resource, slash, they also wanted slash favicon.ico. They're notorious for doing this. Since you and I are using the same connection, we'll need to track our individual packages with sequence numbers. This allows the Puma Kingdom to acknowledge them by number and put split up packages back together if they come out of order. Your sequence order is one and mine is two. Therefore, because they are limiting us to a window size of one initially, you'll have to deliver your package alone before I can deliver mine. Pat's eyes widen. Oh no, but how will I get there without your help? I've never used the TCP turbo line before. Don't worry, it's not as bad as it seems. The turbo line consists of multiple stops at router stations. As long as you have an address, you'll be fine. Each router station has routing table displays that inform carriers which train to board for a given address. Ah, OK, that sounds simple. I think I'm all set. Perfect. Let's get you on the turbo line, then. Pat and Pam rushed over to the turbo line boarding station. Pam handed Pat a copy of the address, his sequence number, and his individual package. Here is everything you'll need. We are running out of time, so please hurry. We don't want Fire Chrome Industries to grow to satisfy our, with our service. Pat nodded with a look of determination. I'll do my best. Thank you for all your help, Pam. Pat boarded the train and waved bye to Pam. As Pat disappeared over the horizon, Pam suddenly grew apprehensive. She realized that she forgot to tell Pat that the routing tables used CIDR addresses, not normal addresses. 
After several milliseconds, Pat reached his first stop. As he disembarked from the train, he became quickly overwhelmed. He could not believe the number of couriers scurrying from train to train. They all appeared to know exactly where to go and what to do. He remembered Pam's advice, though, and looked up to see a large screen with multiple addresses on it. That must be the routing table, he said to himself. He ran over to get a better look. As he examined the table more closely, he became confused. The Puma Kingdom's addresses isn't anywhere on the list. All the addresses look different, too. They have slashes with more numbers in them. Pat frantically looked back and forth from the table to the numerous trains in the hope that he would suddenly know what to do. As he began to feel dismayed, he saw a kiosk with an attendant. He hurried over to the attendant and begged for assistance. Hello, I'm new to the turbo line. I have an address, but I have no idea how to interpret the routing table above. Can you please assist me? The attendant responded, well, of course. I bet you've never seen CIDR addresses. CIDR addresses? Just as I guessed, CIDR, or classless interdomain routing, is just a fancy technique of describing multiple addresses. Let's see your address. Pat handed the attendant the address, and the attendant continued. Ah, your address is 192.30.252.153. That means you'll want to go with that train over there, which is for destinations in 192.30.0.0/16. See, there is an extensive number of router stations, and we can only store so many addresses in our routing tables. Therefore, it's simpler if we use the special CIDR address format to encode multiple addresses. As you know, addresses are four numbers that range from 0 to 255. That range comes from 2 to the power of 8, which is 256. So we can use the slashes as a special way of describing a range for those four numbers altogether. The slash is called a mask, which means it prevents certain numbers from changing. The number after the slash masks numbers from left to right. In the case of 192.30.0.0/16, the number 16 masks the 192 and 30. We use the first 8 of 16 to mask the 192 and the remaining 8 to mask 30. That means this address encompasses all addresses from 192.30.0.0 to 192.30.255.255. We call the mask portion of the number the network address. It describes a network of addresses, like a range. The remaining numbers that can actually range in size comprise host addresses. The way CIDR and routing tables ultimately work is you always want to follow the most specific address range possible. This usually means you want the range that contains your address and that has the largest mask. When you come to your next stop, you should find a different CIDR address with a larger mask. It will encompass a smaller range of addresses. So that's why we say it gets more specific. I believe your next stop has a path for 192.30.252.0 slash 24. See how the 24 will mask 192, 30, and 252? That leaves a smaller range of addresses. Eventually, you'll arrive at the last router station that should get you directly to your final destination. Wow, thanks. That explains a lot. I think I have what I need then. Thank you again. No problem and good luck. With a feeling of relief, Pat ran over to the next train and boarded. The train then dashed off to the next router station. Pat became, accu became accustomed to the flow of the router stations and made more hops from train to train with greater ease. Pat was sure he would arrive at the Puma Kingdom very soon. At one of his last stops, Pat confidently sauntered over to the next train, only to find an attendant blocking the door. Pat approached the attendant. Excuse me, I need to be on this train for my next destination. May I please board? The attendant replied, sorry, sir, this train has reached its max passenger capacity. Due to CCA regulations, I cannot allow you to board. But according to the routing table, this is the train I need. Without this train, I cannot deliver this package. I understand, but regulations are regulations. You're welcome to wait at the station for a short time. Another train on this route may make it in another two to three seconds. Any longer than that, though, and I will have to ask you to return back to your carrier. Oh no, two to three seconds is too long, and why would I need to go back? 
Router station themselves can only hold so many couriers. CCA guidelines dictate that to avoid congestion at stations, attendants must ask couriers after a short while to leave and try their delivery later. This is an extremely important package though. Surely there is something you can do. Is there another route by chance? Pat quickly handed the attendant the address. The attendant examined the address and thought for a moment. Well, typically we prefer carriers take the shortest route to their destination, but there are exceptions. It's a little longer route, but you can take this train and follow the routing table as normal from the next station. Really? That works for me, thank you. Pat rushed off to the train. As he approached the boarding platform, he saw the doors begin to close. He dove with all his might and made it in the train just as the door shut. He breathed a sigh of relief and prepared for the final leg of his journey. Pat finally arrived at the Puma Kingdom and could not contain his excitement. After walking through processing, he stepped outside and was astounded at the sheer height of Ruby Rail's office building, which was like a monolithic structure. He ran into the building with a grin ear to ear and took the elevator to the top floor. Pat exited the elevator, greeting Ruby Rail's receptionist. Hello, I have an important package for Ruby Rails. One moment, please, responded the receptionist. The receptionist picked up the phone and said, Ruby, there is a courier with a package for you. A moment later, the receptionist invited Pat through the door. She will see you now, thanks. Pat braced himself and opened the office door. As he entered, he saw Ruby Rails before him. Reaching out the package, he greeted her in awe. Ruby Rails, it's an honor to meet you in person. My name is Pat Packett. I have a package for you from Fire Chrome Industries. Well, hello, Pat. It's a pleasure to meet you as well, replied Ruby. That looks like an important package. Ruby read through the HTTP message. I see, so they need the root resource. We can definitely help them with that. I'll send the package to my HCO. Excuse me, what is an HCO? Oh, sorry. The HCO is my home controller officer. He handles requests for the root resource. Ruby inserted the package into a tube on the wall and pushed a button. The package whizzed away, and a few milliseconds later, a new package flew down the tube. Ruby handed it to Pat. Here you go, a fresh HTTP response for Fire Chrome Industries. Wow, that was fast. I'll deliver this ASAP. Great. Pat, thank you so much for your delivery. I wish you well on your journey back. We received many packages from Fire Chrome Industries, so I'm sure we will see each other again. Thank you again, Ruby Rails. I look forward to it. Pat left Ruby Rail's office, stopping to let the receptionist stamp an acknowledgement symbol on the response package. Pat returned to the processing station with a smile on his face. Not only had he met Ruby Rails, but he had gained a wealth of knowledge about WAN delivery. He felt confident with his newfound knowledge and knew he had a bright future as a WAN courier. So that concludes our story. And just to circle back up and recap, what have we covered through this story? And it's the idea that as web developers and Rails developers, we need to consider what all it takes just to get a request to our server as well, because it's important information to consider. We saw how we needed DNS to figure out what does this domain name point to, and that it had to go through several other servers just to get an answer. And then we had to use TCP to set up this connection, and we had requests, replies, acknowledgments, just to ensure that the package did get where it needed to go. And then finally, we utilized routing, which took our addresses in smaller ranges to take it from one router to the next till it finally got to our destination. So why is this important? If you recall through the story, I mentioned things like several milliseconds, several milliseconds, and that this all adds up. We have that idea of latency, this physical distance that there's nothing we can do about that from a browser to a server. So this all adds up, and so as web developers and Rails developers, we need to consider this because performance is definitely important. So I say all that to encourage you as you dive more into web development, more into Rails development, to start thinking about these things and looking into them more. Things like caching, whether that's DNS queries or HTML and images and scripts, and that's why we use things you might have heard of like content distribution networks which help reduce that distance from, say, a browser to the content it actually needs. And that just all helps performance in the long run. So finally, I just want to again give a huge acknowledgement to Marissa Roper. She designed all of the illustrations you saw throughout this talk. She is an amazing designer. I encourage you to go check her website out, check her work out, and 
Again, thank you so much, Marissa. And with all of that, thank you all so much for joining me this morning. Appreciate it. <laughs>